It feels like for years now we've gotten a religious horror movie, like, at least once a year, and it usually ends up being really underwhelming and generic. So what the hell is going on? Immaculate just came out and I really liked it, and, and now this? Are people finally doing the genre justice? Genre justice. Wow, am I ever fancy. The first Omen is the fifth entry in the long-running franchise that followed the 1976 classic. Written by Tim Smith, Keith Thomas, and Arkasha Stevenson, with Stevenson taking on the production as her feature directorial debut, the film takes place prior to the events of the original. The first Omen follows Margaret, a young woman who's come to Rome to take her vows and dedicate her life to the church, but slowly learns of an evil underbelly operating below the surface. Okay, so on my last few reviews for newer movies, I did them entirely spoiler-free, but I also had a few people asking me to follow those videos up with spoiler reviews, so I'm going to try something out with this one. The first section of this video will be completely spoiler free, and then I'll give a heads up and drop the curtain and talk about things in more detail, because this movie does need that. I've added chapters to this one, so you can jump to the spoiler section if you want. So when I first found out that there was a legacy sequel for The Omen coming out, I, I really wasn't all that interested. It felt like they were just crossing another classic film off the list and would deliver an underwhelming, generic, and safe flick to try and cash in on a known IP. And then the trailer and poster dropped, which I thought was such a good example of marketing that I made an entire video gushing about it. I still had my reservations though, because while I love how vague and creative that first trailer was, I also know that, you know, making a trailer like that can very easily cover up a mess of a movie. And then I noticed as I was driving to the theater on a dark and stormy night, I was getting more excited than I thought I would be. That marketing really worked, but I was still keeping my expectations level because I had absolutely no reason to assume that this movie would be good. And good God almighty was I ever surprised that this isn't just a solid entry in the franchise, it's by far my favorite one since the original, and might even be my favorite movie of the year so far. That's going to be divisive, but uh, we'll talk about that more in the spoiler section. Before that, though, I want to thank my wonderful Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. These videos take a lot of time and energy to make, and the extra support really helps to keep things moving. If you're interested in getting some bonus material and accessing private supporter-only polls or getting early access to the big videos, consider supporting me on either platform. As a directorial debut for Arkasha Stevenson, this is one of those things that will absolutely make me want to follow her as a filmmaker. The visual style of the first Omen is absolutely striking, which is one of the things that drew me to the trailer that I saw, but I was keeping things in check because I knew they could just be selecting the handful of interesting shots for the marketing. But no. Stevenson creates some beautiful and eerie imagery in this film that lends itself to creating an enchanting atmosphere that I was so glad to see. Walking into a legacy sequel, I don't care that it's a prequel, I'm still calling it a legacy sequel. I really wasn't expecting to see how artsy Stevenson got with the approach to the movie's presentation. It's just not something I've come to expect from movies positioned like this, but a lot of this movie is like looking at a painting, which is my absolute favorite thing when it comes to cinematography. It's beautiful, and there are apparently some places that are showing this on actual 35mm, and if you have the chance to see one of those, then I would say it's absolutely worth it. I really wish there was somewhere near me that was playing a 35mm print, because I would honestly go again just to see it played like that. These grand religious images of the architecture in these locations deserves to be seen in its truest light. A lot of the movie is shot handheld and seems more stylistically similar to something that would have come out in the 70s, and those scenes are often the more grounded ones earlier on in the movie, but when things get a little weirder, the creativity that Arkasha and cinematographer Aaron Morton show behind the camera was really impressive. You can tell that they both care a lot about the movement of the camera throughout scenes, and there's a very distinct style to how they go about capturing a moment that I just loved. It's a very artistic looking film, and there were some creative decisions made with the visuals that got me so immersed. Now I said the word enchanting a moment ago, and I chose that word very specifically, because the first omen achieves this wonderful balance of grounded realism when it needs to, and then melting into a near dreamscape as things progress. That's for a number of reasons, the painting with cameras uh, being one of them, of course, but another massive element of this is the score and the stupid good sound design. The score of The Omen is one of my favorite soundtracks out there, and Jerry Goldsmith's music was an integral part to giving the first three movies a distinct feel. It's not an easy feat to try and follow up music of that caliber, but you know how you get around that problem? 
Hire Mark Corvin. The dude is a wizard and I've been riding his hype train since The Witch and he delivered a ridiculously good score to this movie that has the perfect blend of Goldsmith's more classic score for certain sections of the movie but then again melting into this very dreamy and enchanting feeling. I want to make sure that the score and sound design in this movie get the props they deserve because being in the theater and hearing some of what they did was so insanely cool. A lot of like flittery, spacious little... You know, that's that's the best I can do to describe it. I love flittery, spacious little... And if you like it too, then you're in for a treat. Corvin doesn't just reuse Goldsmith's score, which I think is a good thing because he's such a phenomenal composer that he really should be doing his own music, but of course the iconic music does show up and the way they finally let it explode is perfectly timed and gave me chills. You won't hear it for a while, but it's coming and it's great. Corvin's original score though is a fantastic blend of a more classical style of film composition that then becomes a lot more artsy as things progress. Enchanting really is the best way I can describe the feeling of watching this movie, but it takes a little while before that word becomes an accurate description, which brings me to the narrative and the structural side of the first omen. Now obviously a lot more of this section is going to be saved for the spoilers, but I can go over it a little bit before diving into that. I said that I was excited when I was driving to the theater and sitting there waiting for the movie to start, and obviously I was really happy with how it turned out, but the first act of the movie wasn't really grabbing me, and I was honestly starting to think that it was going to be disappointing for a while. Maybe some of that is because this and Immaculate have an almost funny amount in common with their structure and, and even uh, certain narrative elements and character archetypes, so it could just be that I felt like I just watched an extremely similar setup two weeks ago, but the movie definitely gets off to a slow start. Now, I love slow burns, but I didn't quite feel grabbed by the movie or pulled into the vibe because a lot of that enchantment I was talking about doesn't come until later on. It's a two hour movie though, so I decided to just be patient and, you know, let it establish itself before getting too critical on it and, uh, I, well, there's a scene I'll talk about in the spoiler section that basically punctuates the start of the movie and it's insane. So that's where I started to realize that this thing probably had more up its vagina than it felt like it did to that point. Wait, what? Anyway, the movie setup feels fairly underwhelming, especially because there are a few too many callbacks to the original that feel sort of shoved in out of necessity, but I did at least appreciate that they weren't one-to-one -one with the original and did something slightly different. This sort of thing I think bothers me more in prequels because it can kind of take away the significance of an event happening in the movie that's being prequelized. You wind up going, oh, so this has happened before and it wasn't as special of a moment when it happened around Damien. It's an unfortunate side effect, but thankfully that kind of thing really only comes in the first act and then this movie is very much its own thing after that. Nell Tiger Free in the lead role as Margaret tarnished. gives a fantastic performance. One of the biggest issues I was having earlier on was that I just wasn't connecting with her character, but as with Immaculate, I think that's because we're following very devoutly religious people who are aiming to dedicate their lives in service to the church, so they tend to be a lot more reserved, which is realistic, but it can make it tougher to get invested in them. Thankfully, as things progress and her character's guards are torn down more, she becomes a far more interesting main character and the performance that Free brings is great. There's a scene towards the end where her physical performance sort of blew me away, so massive props to her for sticking the landing on such a demanding role. The movie's damn creepy too, and has what is by far the most unsettling image I have seen in a movie this year. There are jump scares here, but aside from maybe one, I didn't find them too egregious. I think largely because they're not accompanied by, you know, generic, overly loud horror swells that we're used to with this sort of thing. One of them actually got me pretty good, I'll admit. I'm usually pretty good with jump scares, but well, I got a little jolt out of it. And that, in conjunction with the amount of nightmarish imagery on display, can result in some really tense moments that are sure to pucker the cheeks. I found this to be a really well-crafted and super engaging movie that does so many unique and creative things with the way it portrays its story, but... I think where it's going to run into issues for a large portion of the fan base is in its implications to the lore of the Omen. There are some creative liberties taken here that do change uh, pretty substantial plot points from the original, and I'm a little mixed on how I feel about that. If you're going to retcon things, then you really need to make sure you bring the heat and justify why you made those changes, and while I was satisfied enough by the direction they took, there are going to be some people who will be completely turned off by the movie's conclusion. While I wasn't overly bothered by the changes made, what I realized was that while I was really enjoying the movie, 
I was enjoying it more as its own thing than I was thinking about it as a great prequel to The Omen. Sitting with it overnight now, I've actually gotten to really like it in that light despite the changes, but when you retcon something that's pretty core to the backstory of a film, it can sort of call into question why you aren't just making a standalone movie. At some point down the line, I'm definitely going to need to revisit this one and do a more in-depth video after sitting with it for a while, but uh, the more I think about it and come up with my own headcanons for some of the discrepancies, the more and more okay I am with what they did. So that's all I'm going to say before we get into spoiler territory. Aside from a bit of a slow and not super engaging start, I am so pleased with how this movie turned out, especially after being as into the marketing they did as I was. I'm very surprised by just how great this prequel is, and especially by how artistic and experimental a lot of its presentation was, because you just don't see this kind of creativity in legacy sequels very often. I absolutely recommend you check this movie out, but be aware that there are some pretty divisive retcons made to the lore of the franchise. All right. Time to get into spoilers. So the big change that's made in this movie is something that I honestly thought was something we were being misled to believe in the trailer. In the original movie, it's established that Damien was born of a jackal, which is confirmed when Robert and Keith find the remains of one in the burial site next to Robert's biological son. The first omen retcons this origin for Damien, but also switches up the motivations of those behind the conspiracy to bring Damien into political power. Before, they were Satan worshippers who were trying to fulfill a prophecy, but that's been altered now to take a more political and, I'm so sorry, more interesting motivation for bringing the Antichrist to life. The church is worried about the counterculture movement upturning their influence, since you can't use stories that people no longer believe in as leverage. If you tell someone who doesn't believe in God or hell that God will send you to hell if you don't abide by the words of the church, doesn't do a thing. Their solution was to force breed a human woman with what's basically just a sex demon hidden away below the church until she conceives a child that will then birth the Antichrist. There was a very clear intention to touch on sexual assault in the church throughout this movie, and I think that the way they handled those thematic elements was really effective and didn't feel invasive or forced. It's approached as an inherent theme of the story and not something shoved into an unrelated through line. There's actually a fair bit of this sort of exploration of the film's themes, but it all feels very cohesive and effective. So for most of the movie, we're under the impression that a young girl at the orphanage is the one who's cursed to this fate. Most of the children that were born of that blasphemous conception died during the birth, and until the end of the second act, Carlita, the young girl, is the only known survivor of the breeding thanks to information gathered by Father Brennan, who's played by Ralph Innocent, by the way, and that is just beautiful casting. His performance in The Witch is one of my all-time favorite performances in any movie. I love the guy so much. And I'll lick the dust of thine earth. Turns out, though, Margaret herself was also a survivor of this horrific process, and she's the one who's being targeted for the birth of the Antichrist. And she does. She gives birth to Damien. I was thinking that maybe she'd, you know, deliver a jackal and then that thing would birth Damien, but no. There is no jackal. That entire element of Damien's backstory is altered, and that's easily going to be the most divisive thing about this movie. I had comments on videos I made about the first omen saying, it looks like it's a human giving birth to Damien, therefore this movie is terrible. Personally, I don't mind it all that much. As I said before, if you're going to retcon something, then you have to replace it with a story that justifies the retcon, and I enjoyed what this movie did so much that I don't mind changing that detail of Damien's backstory. It's not like they're altering his nature or making it less satanic. It's literally demon in a secret church basement, and if that's not dark enough for you, then I don't know what to tell you. I think if they changed something that had heavier implications on the character of Damien rather than just his backstory, it might have been more of a problem for me, but I, it wasn't. I also really like the more fleshed out motivation for the church to want to bring about the Antichrist so that the population will see the evil he brings and then turn to the church for help after turning their backs to them. That was a really interesting angle, and my headcanon for the bones found in the burial site is that they are the remains of the demon that was in the basement because it gets burned at the end of the movie. There's a definite size difference between them, but it's also a demon, so I don't mind thinking of it like the remains were shrunken and withered after the beast was burned in such an unholy place. Got some holes in it, but works well enough for me, and I'm willing to deal with those holes because I was so into the backstory presented here. It also, like, dovetails into the first movie. The end of this is the same night that the original picks up, and it's a pretty damn smooth transition that makes me want to watch them back to back. It does sort of seem like they may be setting up a sort of continuation, which I wasn't expecting to see since... Well, the original movie is the continuation, but the final scene of the movie shows that Margaret escaped the burning church and is living in isolation with Carlita and another curveball the movie throws, 
Damien's twin sister. Setting something like that up right at the end of a prequel is really interesting to me, uh, and it makes me very curious to see what arkasha has got in mind going forward. I'm open to it, since I think she did such a great job with this, but yeah, there are some massive implications on the lore of the franchise with the way this one concludes. No Jackal, and Damien has a twin sister now. Wild. Also, this movie had to fight hard to get an R rating. I guess they went back and forth like five times with the MPAA because they kept getting an NC-17 over a scene that depicts a demon hand being born quite candidly. What's interesting about it is that the shots that were problematic weren't of a fucking demon hand coming out of a woman's birth canal. It was the shots of her nether bits before the demon hand comes out. So apparently it's less offensive to see that horrific violation of this poor woman's body than it is to show her body, which is really indicative of the way that women are so much more heavily sexualized in media. Showing a demon hand crawling out of a mangled cooch? All G, my G. Showing a cooch with no demon hand? What are you fucking crazy? I don't know, it's, it's just a weird, it is a double standard. There's a lot more like candid male nudity that people don't freak out about. It just seems weird that their problem was with the shots of just, you know, her body and not of the crazy shit going on. It's weird. The scene is absolutely wild though and was very shocking all the same. Oh, also, the image that I was referring to earlier in the spoiler-free section when I was saying that there is an image here that's the most unsettling thing I've seen in a movie this year actually isn't the demon hand. There's a, a nun at this orphanage who hangs herself. You know, it's a throwback to the original. It's, it's all for you. It's a little silly. They light her on fire to try to change it a little bit. Fine, whatever. I didn't love that moment. It does feel a little contrived. Later on, there's a scene where Margaret is locked in a dark room and she hears like a, a noise. Someone calls back to a question that she kind of asked herself and she gets freaked out. And then it's just, you're looking in this dark corner and you're seeing something moving and you can hear something. And it's slowly revealed to be the burned ghostly corpse of the woman who hung herself and the way that it was revealed and the way she's moving as she's coming towards the camera and getting revealed out of the darkness and getting closer and closer and the sound design of the scene was amazing it's such a great moment i had chills i had a huge smile on my face that whole scene it was awesome the movie doesn't shy away from showing some pretty horrific stuff and it all feels very well earned lots of body horror here which i definitely wasn't expecting but it was all so well done that i, I don't mind at all down the line somewhere i absolutely want to revisit this movie in a more detailed video where i've had more time to sit with it and re-watch it and actually have footage to go along with what i'm saying I know just straight up talking head videos are a little harder to keep people engaged with and this is already way longer than I thought it would be, but I just had so many things I wanted to say about this movie because I thoroughly enjoyed it. Arkasha Stevenson has delivered my new favorite entry after the original. It's so well crafted in all aspects from visuals to narrative to performances and music and sound design. It's great. I was so pleasantly surprised by the creative decisions and risks taken in the narrative and the artistic presentation of it all. and. For me, this is the most excited I've been about a new release so far this year. I was absolutely sucked into the dreamscape of this movie after the second act really got going, and I walked out of the theater in a great mood. Well, well, well. There we have it, folks. We're not quite done talking about the franchise yet, because I'm going to have a ranking video out on Monday compiling my overall thoughts on this franchise now that we've got this new entry. And then I'm also going to be streaming that really goofy uh, Lucius game, just for shits and gigs, so keep an eye out for that. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.